Hi, I'm Pamela Paul, editor of the New York Times Book Review, and I am here with Ann Patchett, who I get to introduce now as Pulitzer Prize finalist for her most recent book, The Dutch House. Anne, thanks so much for being here. No one said that out loud. Thanks, Pamela. Here I, you I go. Like I'm You're home. I'm home. Never mind. <laughs> it's your new intro. So congratulations, first of all. Very exciting. Did you think to yourself, like, this is it. This is the book. This is the one that's going to win prizes. No. No, I don't ever think that. Um, I, I just think that's kind of a bad business to be hoping for something. You know, I'm, I, I am very hopeful for the things that I can be responsible for, like going out and promoting it and selling it and getting people excited about it. But the other stuff, no, I, I don't ever think about that. So you once said something very interesting when you set out to write a book that you set a challenge for yourself and that it's often a challenge around the use of time. Time is a subject I think many of us are thinking of these days in this like vaguely nebulous, you know, timeless zone that we're all in. Did you do that with the Dutch house? And can you talk a little bit about that idea? Um, actually, I did that with the book that is right over your head, which was Commonwealth. Um, so in my books, there you go, uh, time had been getting more and more compressed. Bel Canto was three weeks, State of Wonder was 10 days, Run was 24 hours. So I just felt like I was getting all boxed in and I wanted to write a book over a long period of time. So Commonwealth took place over about 40 years and I loved it. So I thought, all right, the next book I write, I'm going to put it in that big hunk of time again. And I am really obsessed of time. But the thing that I did that was my challenge in the Dutch house was writing it in first person, which I hadn't written a book in first person since 1997. My wow. Book. Oh, that's not even true. 1994, my second novel was in first person. And then I felt like I had outgrown it and abandoned it. And I thought it would be really interesting to come back. I, I always thought, oh, first person's for kids. I love reading first person novels, but in terms of writing them, I like to write from third person. So that was the challenge. And I actually found it unbelievably hard. So you have the title, how, the word house in your title this time. And that is probably where most of our listeners, our participants today are. <laughs> what role yes. does a house play in the Dutch house? Well, you know, the, the Dutch house is where the memory is lodged. It's where the parents were still alive and happy and together. It's when the family was stable and united and still wealthy. Uh, so, so the house is a really beautiful and important house, but it is more that the house is where the past is stored. So the characters keep coming back to the house and coming back to the house after they've been thrown out of it over the course of their life. But really it's about not being able to let go of the past, which is a problem. <laughs> so you are kind of a triple threat in the literary world. You are not only an author, um, you're probably one of the most prodigious readers that I know. And that is tied into the third thing you do, which is you are the co-founder and co-owner of a bookstore, Parnassus Books, which yes. is in Nashville and in the airport, importantly. Um, yeah. A great airport bookstore. Um, <laughs> what are those roles feeling like for you these days? Well, I really don't feel at all like an author these days. Um, I'm just a, I'm a bookseller and a book promoter. And I am obsessed with two things right now. I want to keep my business alive. I want to make sure that people are supporting their small bookstores because someday this is going to go away. And we want to make sure those businesses are still there. So I am in the bookstore every day. We are not open, but we're shipping books. I am shipping books. I am writing cards. I'm shooting videos. Do you know this? I'm making all of these little videos uh, where I'm promoting books. So I put on a ball gown every couple of days or a cocktail dress and I hold up books that I love and I'm making little 30 second videos for Instagram which is funny because I'm not on social media. So I've actually never seen any of these videos, but, but how do we keep 
promoting new books. You're doing it. That's amazing. We're but doing we it right here. Voices. We're doing it right here. You know, they're like Ann Tyler has a new book out, Stephen King, John Grisham. You know, there are people, they're always going to get their audience. But then there are people who have brand new books coming out. And it sort of fills me with terror. You know, I just want to make sure that somehow I can alert people to these books. I want to talk about some of those new authors, but it occurs to me that the last time I saw you in person, you were in a ball gown, practically. Yeah, that's how you think of me now. Um, <laughs> with one of our guests and participants later on, Lisa Lucas. Um, but let's talk about that challenge. Let's talk first about the general challenge as a bookseller, because you and I are very aware of this problem. Um, probably many of our audience members here are. New York Times people care about books. Surely yeah. the group who has joined us today cares a lot about books. What's going on with the book selling landscape, with retail, and specifically with independent bookstores, which is what you own? Well, it's a trick, you know, we're closed. And we have all of these books inside. And it's about, Primarily keeping people safe, you know, making sure that our staff is safe. We had a lot of staff members at the beginning who said, I just don't feel comfortable coming into the store. And then we had a group of staff members who are like, we're here no matter what. We are the Marines. We are going to be here night and day shipping out books and making sure that our customers know that we're still engaged. Nashville has been so tremendously supportive of us and people are ordering their books and you know but it's just kind of constantly raising that awareness we are now doing curbside delivery which we weren't doing for a while so it's, it's like getting a pizza you can call and say i want writers and lovers by lily king and we're like okay we'll meet you outside and toss it into the back of your car people have been very joyful about the whole thing but it, it's this it's a constant effort of lifting up awareness, both of the store that we are still here, that so many independent bookstores across the country are still here. How do we keep our audience engaged? And then also, how do we promote the new books? How does that work? If somebody wants to buy a book from Parnassus, they go online, they can order it. There's someone in your store sort of physically yep. picking it out and dropping it off? We have a lot of people in our stores. And in fact, one thing that we've started doing that has been really successful is we now have gift boxes. So we did Mother's Day boxes. And I did a little video and said, I will write your mother a Mother's Day card. I wrote 250 Mother's Day cards. And then we pick out the books and we pick out little gifts and cards and a candle and whatever and make up the box. One of the things I've really discovered is that people don't want a choice all the time you know sometimes people are like here's my credit card number could you just take care of this for me and send the baby present the birthday present now we're into father's day graduation so that's been a lot of fun i just to go around with a little description this is what my dad likes to read and then we will figure out the rest of it and make a box full of gifts and send it out how can we continue to be creative and fresh I mean, imagine a lot of people want to know, what is Anne Patchett reading? What does Anne recommend? What do the other people who work in your store, who they probably know well, recommend? Like, how do you get that kind of aspect of hand selling and word of mouth that normally makes a local bookstore such a part of a community work? Right. Well, we do that through these videos that I'm doing, promoting different books, but also through the boxes, because those really are the books that I'm reading or, you know, there's some categories. If people say my mom really likes sci-fi fantasy, you know, I know who to go to on staff to say, we need this historical fiction. I am not so great. Mystery, horror. I am terrible at mystery and horror. Uh, so, you know, there, we all have our strengths and abilities and then we can put together great gifts. And of course, a lot of what we do is still just people calling and saying, the Night Watchman, uh, Valentine. Valentine, right. I love Valentine. Uh, so, and that's another challenge, to not get into a rut that I have six books that I'm just sending out to everybody over and over again. Well, I was going to ask, since you said you're not a horror or science fiction or a fantasy fan, like, <laughs> what is the Anne Patchett sweet spot? Like, I do. Uh, I'm, I'm really good, obviously, at literary fiction. 
I'm good at memoir. I'm, I'm pretty good at children's, especially middle grade and little kids. Um, I'm good at essays, funny things. You know, I was just horror. I, yeah, zero. You know I'm gonna stop you on funny. I'm gonna stop you on funny because that's something I think people need. Like, what makes you laugh? What books are like, these are the surefire things that you think are funny? You know, it's, I love the new Emma Straub book, All Adults Here, which I thought was very funny. You know, it's not something, it's not David Sedaris. If somebody wants to just roll around on the floor and laugh, I'm gonna send them David Sedaris always. Um, Brother to the More Famous Jack is a great funny novel. See now this, I'm gonna, I have, I have all these notes of things to recommend and I did not bring my list of very, very funny books. Um, I'm totally stumped. I'm funny I'm, stumped. I don't want to stump you. I don't want to stump you. I'm going to ask you a really good question. I'm going to wake up in the middle of the night and I'm going to think, what was the funny, what's the funniest book you've read lately? Well, the next time that I've read? Yeah, you. Or you. me? The funniest yeah. book I've read recently, um, and I've talked about it a bit, um, is, and it's very on topic, um, The Plague and the Eye, which is an old book by Betty McDonald. I think you would love it, Anne, so I'm going to recommend okay. it to you. Um, but I'll, it's I'll get it at my local independent bookstore. That's right. Oh, you know another one that I sell a lot that I love? A book called Love, Nina by oh, Nina Stibby. Oh, Nina Stibby. I, I adore that book. And again, it's funny, but it's, it's just very, very warm. It's interesting. Okay, I'm going to go on warm it now because you mentioned children's books and said you were good with children's books. You recently wrote this great essay for us about your discovery of Kate to Camillo. And I went ahead and I read that book as part of my book club, The Miraculous oh, Journey of Edward Tulane. Yes, we took your advice, Anne. And, um, and you had mentioned in that essay that you hadn't been a big reader of children's books for yourself before. So how did you get into that book and what effect did it have? Well, the reason that I started reading Kate D. Camillo, which was probably going on two years ago, was I had met Kate a couple of times. She'd come to the bookstore, done some events, just, you know, really, really briefly. And then Nell Freudenberger, also a fabulous novelist, asked me if I knew her, wanted to pass a message on to her about how much she and her son had loved The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane. And I thought, I've got to start reading these books. Like I know this woman and I have not been reading her books. And then I just fell into it. Once I started, I couldn't stop. And one of the things that I love about Kate's work is there's so many different categories. So, you know, if they're picture books for the early readers, and then you have the Mercy Watson books, they're the Dekawu Drive. Have you looked at the Dekawu Drive books, Pamela? Fantastic. Just a little under the novels in an age group. And there's a new one coming out in June called Stella Endicott and the Anything is Possible Poem, which is just my favorite, Dekawu Drive. But what's been so interesting is at first when I was reading Kate, I was thinking, oh my God, I love middle grade fiction. This is just a door being thrown open. Then I started reading a lot of other middle grade fiction and I found, no, you know, it's, it's not that I love middle grade fiction necessarily, it's that I love Kate D. Camillo. And now I'm sort of finding my way. I'm, I'm now reading Roald Dahl for the first time in my life. Oh my God. I don't have kids. I, I finished reading BFG last night. I'm going to give a secret, a, a Roald Dahl tip, which is that he has recorded some of his own books on audio, oh. which I highly recommend hearing him deliver um, as he wrote them. Yeah. But Many readers, they know the Royal Dolls. As you mentioned, they know that there's a new Grisham. They know there's a new Scott Turow. They know about the new Lawrence Wright. What about debut authors right now? Um, I, you mentioned that you're concerned about getting the voice out. Like, who do you want to get onto the rooftops and, you know, herald as, as new voices? I have some right here. <laughs> um, books. Can I, can I talk about a couple of things that are coming out in June? Yes, we are here to find out what to read. This is always the problem, right? Because we read so far ahead. So a book, a, a first time novel that I love that's out right now, I just mentioned Valentine, Elizabeth Wetmore, 
an amazing, amazing first novel. Uh, this is the book that I really want everyone to read. It's coming out in June. It's called Thank You for Voting, The Maddening, Enlightening, Inspiring Truth About Voting in America by Aaron Geiger Smith. Boy, I am gonna be selling the hell out of this in June because it's a, it's a small book and it's sort of everything that you need to know about the history of voting and why voting is important. And it's a book that you can give to graduates, you can give to people who you love who just don't vote, or if you are excited about voting and want to get people involved. It's a really, really good book. And what I love about it is that it's short. Like everything in this book, there are thousands of pages written about all of these topics, but she condenses it. It's a wonderful overview. Um, this is a book that I love that's coming out in June called the Dragons, the Giant, the Women by Y.A. Tumor. Is this come across your? Yes, and she wrote a memoir um, that I came this out a memoir. last year. She wrote a memoir before, oh, that's the memoir. This is a memoir. Okay. Uh, it's and interesting, it reads <laughs> so much like a novel. And it is the story of her family's uh, flight from civil war in Liberia and coming to the States, but it is so gripping and so well-written and really reads like a novel. And then I'll tell you what I'm reading right now. Started it yesterday. Um, the Lady's Handbook for Her Mysterious Illnesses. Is, are you familiar with this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just came out. And really, this, this is a reason why it's so good to have a bookstore. Because I just picked it up. I, I like the cover. I like the title. And I fell into it. So this is a story about a woman having a long-term serious illness and then finding all of these other young women who have very similar serious illnesses. But you know, you just think this is an enormous amount of work. It's just come out now. Who's gonna sell this thing? So me. You I'm just did. This thing. I mean, yes, it's interesting. You. So you're just as susceptible to covers, to the title, to just kind of Good. discovering. How do you choose what to read? And how do you kind of keep your work reading, which I'm assuming is a lot of it, separate from your, you know, private Anne reading? I have almost no private Anne reading. <laughs> I mean, I've had more of it during this pandemic time than I have in a while because I've had hard time reading. And so I'm, I'm much more likely to just stick with the books that I love, you know, like saying, I'm going to read Roald Dahl. What the hell? I'm, that's where I'm going to go. Uh, the vast majority of the reading that I do is for our first editions club. So we are always looking for a book that's coming out in four or five months. And every month we have a signed first edition that we mail out. It's like fruit of the month club doesn't rot. And, um, and that's what I'm always struggling with. There's a woman who works with me on staff, Kat, hi Kat. Uh, and she and I are the two people who are mainly always reading this book. So, so if Kat doesn't like something, I am never going to touch it. If I say to Kat, you know, I read this book, I couldn't stand it, she is never gonna read it. But if she loves something, I'm gonna read it. And that's what it always is. I feel like I'm on this treadmill. Okay, we just got the book for July. Now we've gotta find a book for August. What's coming up in September? Um, and some months are a lot harder than others. Finding a really great novel in December is completely different from finding a really great novel in September. We are on the same treadmill that, that stops in December. Um, I want to ask a question actually from one of our audience members because you mentioned this is the book you want to give to graduates. This is a book you mentioned a couple of June books. So one of our audience members, Sarah asks, can you recommend some books for graduating high school senior? Any genres welcome? Graduating high school senior, it's so funny. The book that immediately springs to mind is Emily St. John Mandel's Station Eleven uh, because it's, it's a great pandemic novel. And while I think that probably a lot of grownups don't necessarily want to read pandemic novels right now, I think a lot of young people really do. And it's a book with a very heroic young main character um, fighting and finding her way and taking care of herself. Um, you know, it, it depends so much on the person. Deacon King Kong, James McBride, which was 
it just seems to be a book that is so brimming with life and hope and somebody continually getting knocked down and springing back up again. It's a book that I really, really love. Um, Writers and Lovers, which is the book that I wanna to sell to everybody now because I find that to be such an incredibly comforting, sweet, kind, and actually that is a really good book for a graduating senior, especially somebody who's interested in the arts because it's the journey of a young woman who is struggling and working as a waitress and wanting to be a writer and then eventually making it. So Absolutely. that would be another really good one. Oh, and of course, perennially tiny, beautiful things, Cheryl Strayed, the book that I think everybody should read at this time, but especially graduates, because it's just chock full of such brilliant and open hearted advice. All right. I have another audience question. This one is coming from Allie, who says, this is gonna put you on the spot, but sorry. Um, I would love to hear Anne share which literary technique will be her legacy. Are you planning for your legacy yet? Um, when critics 50 years from now talk about the Pachettian voice, what will they be referencing? You know, that is so kind. That is so, so kind of anyone to think that anyone is gonna be reading Patchett novels 50 years from now. But that kind of goes along with, do you think you're going to win prizes? I don't think anybody's going to be reading me 50 years from now. I mean, I'll be dead. It won't make any difference to me. And also, I've never read any of my books again. So, you know, I finish something, it's done. I never think about it. I never go back. I don't have any idea what my overarching legacy would be. Well, except kindness. That's the thing that people always gripe about with me, that I'm too nice um, and my books are too nice and they're full of nice people and I'm too nice. So it, it probably will be the burden of kindness in, in Patchett's oeuvre. <laughs> <laughs> the Patchettian sign, uh, the sign of Pachetti in literature will be kindness. All right, yeah. here's another question. Um, I have more questions, but I'm, I'm sending it over to our, our audience members here. That's Megan fun. asks, during times of stress, such as now, but not necessarily just now, are you interested in subject matters close to the source of your stress or, on the contrary, try to read or otherwise be as far away from your reality as possible? Hmm. Well, the book, when this first kicked in, the thing that I wanted to read, just like a magnet in my chest, I wanted to read Catherine Ann Porter's Pale Horse, Pale Rider again, which I hadn't read in 20 years. And it, to my mind, is the great pandemic story about the Spanish flu. Uh, and it was very hard to read. It was painful to go back and, and think about that again but it sort of sated me and I thought, okay, now I have read the great pandemic fiction and I can move on. Uh, so that said, now I seem to be reading as far away from it as possible. Like I am, I am not cracking that new Lawrence Wright it scares me. <laughs> I, he'll be fine. I think, yeah, um, I think, I think he's going to do great. <laughs> So we talked a little bit about June. We are on the brink of summer. We are, word is, you know, out about summer reading. I'm curious in general, what does summer reading mean to you? And now let's get away from this summer just for a moment. What do you think of when you think of that praise? I, I'm so glad you asked. I think of summer reading tables. And long before I had a bookstore, that's what I would always do every year. I would go to a bookstore and look at the high school summer reading tables and I would look for the book that I had never read. And so every summer I would read a book like um, The Bridge of San Luis Rey. Somehow I just missed it. One summer I read Moby Dick. One summer I read Great Expectations. And there, there are just holes for everybody, books that we, meant to read, should have read in school, didn't read, I don't know. And so that's what I always go back to. And I love 
having the bookstore, we've got a big binder from all the different schools and I can go through the binders and look at what different schools are reading for summer reading, but that's what summer reading means to me. It does not mean chick lit and a margarita on the beach. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because I asked you when you did buy the book uh, feature an interview with us in 2013, I asked you about classic books and you were like, oh, I used to love them, but now with the bookstore, I very rarely have time to go back. Yeah, um, that's true. Are you, are you making time now? Is there a classic that you want to read this summer? Um, well, there are classics that I want to read every summer. Um, will I actually manage that? Probably not. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I will say, okay, maybe I'm doing more classic children's literature and I feel good about that. Um, I know that right when the bookstore opened, I was reading Middlemarch and I was two thirds of the way through and it's been eight and a half years and I still think that I'm going to get back to the last <laughs> third of Middlemarch, which let's be honest, I'm going to have to start back at the beginning. Right. So you're going to have to be my the whole town section, the whole sort of local politics thing. Yeah, right. But, but it's also really interesting to watch these books go out the door. I was in the bookstore yesterday and my sister is the person who's in charge of shipping at the bookstore. And so, you know, she's got this giant table with all of the books out. And there was a copy of the Makioko sisters. And my heart just leapt. I thought, oh, what a fantastic time to read the Makioko sisters. We have been selling War and Peace just night and day, thanks to Eun Lee right? And her right. War and Peace book club. She's really, really engaged people. It's called Tolstoy Together is the project. And so that's been going out. I've been really pushing Dickens because I think that David Copperfield, if you haven't read David Copperfield, you know, that's the giant book that you've Is that your favorite into. Dickens? What? Is that your favorite Dickens? It is. Yeah. It, your, what's yours? Bleak House. Oh, I love Bleak House. I love Bleak House. You know, in her um, By the Book uh, interview many years ago, J. Courtney Sullivan said that she rereads re it every year, which I find unfathomable. But nonetheless, I think that's what finally got me to read it. She did that before she had kids. That's the answer. Yeah, I think that okay. that's exactly what it is. <laughs> so She's, other, She's a writer I love. Other than the run on War and Peace, this is a question from one of our audience members. Have you noticed a change in your customers' reading habits since the current moment began? You know, that's an interesting question. And I would say no, because when people are shopping, I'm, I don't see what they're buying, right? I'm not ordering books and I'm not checking people out. So I don't have the same awareness unless I happen to be on the floor. And if I am on the floor, I'm really nosy. And I'm always going over to somebody and say, let me, you know, let me see what you've got. What are you reading? What are you interested in? Uh, but now that we're shipping and in the back, I feel very aware of what people are reading and, and coming back to. Yeah. Do you miss that? Like snooping around, seeing what people are looking at, like, looking over people's shoulders, that sort of, not just in the store, but in everyday life, you know, where you get to look at what people are reading and kind of get a sense of the reading vibe? Well, I, you know, what I really miss is not having a sense of it because people are reading on their phones or their iPads, or maybe they're not even reading on their phones and iPads. Maybe they're checking their social media and ordering shoes. But I miss being able to walk down the aisle of a plane and look and see what everybody is reading and that nosiness, yeah. You know, I once sat next to Kate DiCamillo on a plane and I remember I was like looking, I knew it was her, so I was looking in, at what she was reading. So some people, maybe it's what just us. I, you know, I can't remember, I can't remember. It was coming back from the Miami Book Fair uh, a number of years ago. So thinking about this summer, do you think summer reading is going to look different? I mean, what is it going to be this summer? Do you have a sense? Well, are you talking about for kids or are you talking about, are you talking about summer reading the way I talk about summer reading? I'm talking about the way you talk about it. School. 
Yeah, I think that some are reading oddly. This is just me being optimistic, which, you know, is my downfall. Uh, I think that summer reading is going to be more important and taken more seriously because my gosh, the kids are home. They're not going to camp. They're not being stretched in a million different ways. And so I feel like people are really gonna get on their summer reading assignments. What I find is there are two kinds of kids. There are the kids that come the day school's out and they get every single one of their summer reading books. And then there are the kids who come three days before school starts again and get all of their summer reading books. And there's almost nothing in between. And so I'm imagining that probably people are going to be starting a lot earlier. I had a colleague of my husband's call me last night and said their 14 year old son, they cannot shovel books at him fast enough. And he had just finished reading the overstory. There's a great book, you know, mm. this would be the perfect time to read the overstory because it's nice and long and complicated. And I, I went down and stood in front of my own bookcases and got the kid on the phone and just said, have you read the Brothers Karamazov? Have you read Dracula? Have you read The Blind Assassin? Have you read James Baldwin's Another Country? No, no, and I'm just pulling things off and, and I got a suitcase <laughs> and filled the suitcase full of books. So there are also those kids. All right, I want to ask you one final question before we switch over to our next very exciting panel. Um, and that is, you have a whole bunch of people watching us right now. They are all book people. They care passionately, as you do, about the literary world. And they're like, what, what can I do? What can I do to help? You know, there are, the libraries are closed. Some bookstores are open a little bit, maybe not entirely. What would you do if you were a concerned book citizen of the world? What would you recommend they do? Go to the website of your local independent bookstore and buy a book. It's not that big a deal. You can call them, they may be open, but a lot of bookstores that are closed are still shipping. So just make the effort to shop local. I feel like I have been singing this song at the top of my lungs for eight and a half years. The importance of community, the importance of the tax base in your community. Put your money back into your community by shopping local, buying books, stay connected. And, and I think that it's, it's proving to be true right now. We need people and we also really long to be there for people. And check out the website because so many of the bookstores are also having content. So we're having author talks and doing all sorts of creative things. Again, doing book videos or selling book boxes or whatever. Just do a little bit and, and that will be doing your part. And everybody will be so grateful and this will be over and you'll still have a bookstore in your community. All Yay. right. Well, I'm going to send Ann Patchett back to the back of Parnassus Bookstore so that she can look at what people are ordering and, and give the books to her sister to send out mm -hmm. um, and, and thank her. Thank you so much for being here. But I want to say, don't sign off yet, everyone else. Um, we have a panel coming up. My colleague, John Williams, who edits the critics of the New York Times and does a lot of writing and is familiar to many as a frequent contributor to the book review book podcast is joining now with two very exciting guests, our colleague, Paul Sagel, a book critic for the New York Times, and Lisa Lucas, who is the head of the National Book Foundation. And once again, I want to say thank you, Anne. It is such a pleasure to see you from across the screen. Thank you so much for being here. And Pamela, thank you for making this work, because we were supposed to do this live together in New York. And you went the extra mile to make sure that we could do it this way. And I'm very, very grateful. And be well. Be well. Take care. Thank you. Over to you, John. Thank you so much, Pamela. Um, podcast host and now Zoom host extraordinaire um, and the immensely charming Ann Patchett. I'm John Williams, the Daily Books editor at The Times. And I'm pleased to be joined, speaking of charming, by uh, two guests. A Parl Sagel, a book critic at the New York Times, who I'm extremely lucky to get to work closely with, um, and Lisa Lucas, the executive director of the National Book Foundation. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Parl. Hey, John. Thanks for being here. 
we're going to talk a bit about what we're reading these days. Um, I'm going to start with you, Lisa. Sadly, uh, not just what you're reading these days, but where are you these days? You're normally a neighbor of mine here in Brooklyn. I am normally a block away from you, but I'm in Los Angeles. Um, and I've been here for the past like 72 days, I think. I came for six days. And um, it ended up being a much longer trip. I uh, did not actually come back. Um, not planned. So it's been really weird, the reading, because I don't have my bookshelf. I'm like really jealous of everyone's gorgeous backdrops because they've got all of their like beloved books from like years of reading and working in books. And I just like have my little sad pile of things that I've been able to order here. Okay, so, what, so how, have you, how have you been getting books? So I've been trying to, you know, Anne made some extremely good points about independent um, booksellers. Most of them just came from bookstores all over the country. So I usually get to travel and pop into Parnassus in Nashville or Skylight in LA or at home go to Bookstore Magic or McNally or Spoonbill in Sugartown. So I basically just picked the bookstores that I know best, East Bay booksellers in Oakland or, you know, in, the, in the East Bay. Um, and I've just been ordering you know, what I see. It's harder to get physical books. I'm much more of a physical book reader. So I've just been kind of going to everybody's website, calling them and saying, what do you want to recommend? I have no idea. Well, you're um, lucky because you have that, that special red phone that's hooked into every bookstore in the country. <laughs> it's called Twitter. <laughs> Parl, how about you? You're, you're surrounded by your usual books, but has the, uh, has the current moment done anything in particular to your reading habits or given the yeah. nature of your job, is it pretty much the same? Yeah, I'm pretty monkish, I have to admit. Um, and I am in my Brooklyn borough still. I think, I think like most people, the challenge when it comes to reading has been, you know, working and, and looking after people. In my case, looking after children, looking after sick people. Um, and so trying to find the time to do it. And again, like, like most people also finding that one's attention is fractured, it's splintered. We're, we're constantly panicked. So that feeling of, can I sink into a book, which book, what kind of book, experiencing some of that at the beginning, and then suddenly finding that in the time I have now, free time, which is very limited, I just read. That's all I've been doing. And I've been trying to understand um, why that is. And I think that there's a certain kind of sociality of reading. There's a certain kind of intimacy with reading. There's a way that it can recreate the world that we don't have right now, you know, that feels a bit more... Uh, intimate and intense than a show, you know, it sort of can recreate the friends. It can sort of recreate a lot of that stuff that seems to be on hold. So I tend to read at night or a lot around the edges when I have like two minutes and my small charges are not here. Um, and so I find I've been reading shorter things and uh, little like short stories have come back and diaries and a lot of collected criticism I've been reading just for that um, quick sort of uh, draft of something sarcastic and funny and, and sharp and something that can sort of hook me. Are you, are you rereading things or like sort of in pieces or are you still picking up things that you've been meaning to get to for a long time? A bit of both. I mean, some of the, I've, I've been, um, some of it has been new sort of reading the James Walcott collected essays, Critical Mass. I don't know if you guys read it, but if you're somebody that feels like, you know, what's the thing that can bring me back to reading? Um, for me, it's always been criticism. It's always been that kind of voice and that kind of swagger and that kind of making a case for it. It feels like news. The good critics always feel like news. They make a, a sense of occasion for it. So some new stuff. Um, I'm not a big book club person, but I've started reading. Uh, I've, I've started trying with my dad, who's sort of fallen in love with ballet late in life. And so I recommended Fantastic Apollo's Angels. I don't know if people have read it by Jennifer Homan. It's a beautiful history of ballet. So yeah, so in these ways that my, my reading has changed and become kind of more social and uh, that's nice, a two-person book club with your dad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Lisa, what's on your little pile of what I assume will now forever be known in your heart as your L.A. library? You'll probably have a yeah, separate shelf no, I mean, it's, been, it's funny, you know, my reading has been super scattered. I usually read a lot. I usually read on the subway, mm. you know, and doctors, waiters, rooms, and, you know, in all the spaces in between, because it's busy, and, you know, the airplane or in the you know, the lobby of a train station. So it's been really hard to sort of reconfigure my entire life to read. So it's like a lot of it has been aspirational. There's a stack growing and I know that I will get to all of these things. But um, right now it's been a kind of mix. I've definitely been chasing pleasure reading, um, things that are sort of linear, things that really well paced. Um, right now I'm reading Elizabeth Little's Pretty as a Picture, um, which I don't usually read thrillers or mysteries at all. and. Um, 
I have to say, um, she is a local Angelino, my new local for a short while. And so it's like, I've been really interested in things that are about LA or written by LA writers. So that's been really interesting. I also came out of the gate and was reading like Parable of the Sour Sower, um, which I'd never read. And I did, you know, at first I was like, I hate this. And I realized why I hated it was because the world was falling apart as I was reading it. Um, and I can't stop thinking about it. So I actually did really love it. I think it was just a very odd time to read it. Um, and I've been like reading like a lot of graphic novels. I've been reading Saga, which I had never finished. So I got the like Copendium, which is like a nice square, like 1500 pages of, you know, extremely well-written, extremely well-paced, really fun sort of space opera. Um, but then there's also like, you know, I missed the boat on uh, Yi and Lee's War and Peace, but there is like a really strong desire in me to go back to the things that I've loved. So like, um, the, uh, my quarantine bay has been reading, uh, the house of mirth mm -hmm. and that's my favorite and I reread it often. And so there's now a copy floating around the house. Um, and I, I feel like I might revisit that Budden Brooks, which I've never read. And then, uh, one of my extraordinary colleagues, Anna Dobbin has promised me that she will, um, read Middlemarch with me, which is one of her favorite books and something that I have failed to read. So it's all over the place, but poetry, short books, graphic novels, you know, things that I, I'm so outside right now of the normal publication promotion cycle. It's like I read um, primarily paper books, not um, digital books, which I'm learning how to do alongside all 25 National Book Awards judges. So in solidarity, I'm going to not not do that. But, um, you know, it's just been like a real moment to sort of read outside of that kind of constant churn of this is coming out in six months, you've got to get it done, while also ordering books, like kind of as everyone does, like this book is available for sale and it just came out today. And I honestly, like I bought, um, you know, I've been, you guys' work has been enormously important. Like where I just read reviews to figure out what to read instead of reading galley letters or, you know, having somebody call me or having lunch and an editor will bring you some books that are coming out in eight months. You know, so it's like, I've got, um, I'm looking at my stack here, I've got, um, this one, which I'm really excited with. Uh, and you know who made me read this one um, after an extraordinary review. Um, so it's just been, you know, essays. Studs Terkel has been on my mind a lot. Um, he's one of my absolute favorites. Oral history is just, you know, one of my favorite things in the world. So I've been dipping in and out of hard times. Um, talking about being outside of the usual publishing industry loops. Are you also literally outside? Are you reading in the LA sunshine at all? I hate to say it, but yes, I have been reading outside in some sunshine. That's okay. It's getting nice here too. So we're less jealous than we would normally. Cool, 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 cool. Yes, there's some good weather here. Although it's a lot of sunshine. I'm not really quite, like I'm used to like a rainy day, sitting on your couch, reading mm -hmm. for six hours just because there's nothing else to do. And it is a little relentless. <laughs> <laughs> a little variety is nice. Parl, you did read, you did just recently review the Coast and Bound book. Um, yeah. What... Is the current situation having any effect on the books you, I know you had your eye on that one for a while, but is there any sense of it at all sort of creeping into your work brain where you think about what you want to write about? Or you just wrote this beautiful essay for us this week about the nature of time and books and, and the way different authors approach that it. That was a gorgeous, thank gorgeous you. essay. Thank you, thank you. Written in the car outside of the apartment, you know, and stolen moments. Yeah. So, <laughs> but um, that's such a nice question, John. No, I don't know if it's if it's changing what I want to read, I think it definitely changes as we're writing these pieces, how we frame them and how we choose to frame them. There's a temptation to sort of frame every review and every book as in this moment, you know, and like, this is the book you need, or this is the book that can elucidate something. And I think that for me, the challenge is to sort of remember all the other things we are and all the other things that these books have to speak to and not worry about trying to find that timely hook for everything. These books are about things that are timeless and endlessly applicable. And um, so, yeah, so not doing that in these pieces, but then also trying to, I think um, there's a sense of mission a little bit right now because these writers have less opportunities to promote these books and to get them out there. And so when you do find something that feels so worthy and so beautiful and strange, and you really do want to um, really translate as forcefully and clearly and eloquently you can everything that is contained in this book so it can find readers. Are you finding it e as easy as ever to find new books or is it, um, are you keeping up with any of the promotional things that are going on online and things like that? Who, me? Yeah. Well, either of you. <laughs> 
I mean, I know that it's I'm more, not... it's more important to me now, you know, yeah. I mean, it's like the recommendation chain has been broken, you know, I, obviously I always follow a lot of booksellers and I'm following lots of authors and, you know, reading lots and like lit hub and everywhere about just like, you know, New York times everywhere about debut authors, you know, you really want to promote folks who are coming out right now. Um, but it's harder, you know, it's like, for me, a lot of the promotion that I can do about stuff I'm excited about is physical pictures of books that I'm excited to read, you know? And it's like, I just finally got the Adrian Tamine book um, that's coming out this summer. And it's like, I, you know, the pictures went up immediately because he's one of my favorites. And you also want people to support Drawn and Quarterly. You want people to support. And so it's really difficult, you know, to, to figure out a new way to hunt for what's going to be exciting because there's a lot of noise right now and there's a lot of disruption, but it's still happening, right? That's the beautiful thing. It's just different. Well, Lisa, you've been, um, I, I would, I don't think anyone probably has their finger on the pulse of what's going on out there in the world more than you do. Do you, what's your sense of how, I know that Anne talked about how uh, her bookstore is, is selling things to pick up and um, mm -hmm. what's your sense, when am I going to be able to browse in a bookstore again, do you know? I is 2026, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, browsing inside of anywhere, I have no idea, but I think that it's been really extraordinary to see how absolutely creative so many of the booksellers around the country have been. I mean, it's just like, you know, call Elliott Bay Books and they'll recommend two books for you. You know, Square Books in Mississippi was, you know, they usually have a big table of, you know, discount books outside. So you give them 25 books and you get a secret, you know, selection of three of them that are out there. You know, people doing videos, you know, the, sh the, the shelf talker is is now digital and i think that people are thinking about like you know and talking about the videos that she's doing on instagram you know we're doing tours on the nbf uh, instagram of different authors bookshelves and what they're reading um and i think that uh you know people and their bookstores that they love so i think it's just been really extraordinary i mean i think that there's a lot of disruption people have to wait a little bit longer i mean we're impatient right it's like why isn't my book here you know, I think one of the things that you see online is some of the booksellers being like, I got cursed out by, you know, X, Y, and Z person that's book didn't arrive in seven days. And it's like, you know, they're in the, you know, in like the basement of a bookstore, you know, with a staff of two, six feet away from each other, trying to get them out, but they're getting them out. That book will get there. And I think that that's just extraordinary. And also publicists, you know, figuring out how to encourage people to read, you know, Kindle files or PDFs and, you know, and, and, and trying to really come up with clever ways like Riverhead, um, which is a publisher has been sending these like phone calls every week between some of their authors to promote the work. And, and it's just, it's, it's funny. You think you, re you realize that real people are making books in a way right now and selling books than we might have, um, you know, just three months ago. And I have been glad that, um, you know, we're not, the movies or baseball or you know there's something great about the privacy of books and the fact that that can continue more or less you know more uninterrupted than other things can um absolutely and uh but but are there things coming out are there a couple of books and you mentioned adrian tomine's new book is there anything mm -hmm. else this summer that you're particularly excited about that's going to be new super um i'm excited about masha gessen's surviving autocracy which i think is good which i read early on and was also you know maybe like a poor idea for the first week of quarantine um but it was extraordinary and i'm pretty sure she's written a new introduction for it and i just think that she's got such an extraordinary political mind and unpacks you know being a russian person and being able to really look at the united states and unpack what we're going through in really clear uh, pithy language, I think, is she's so readable, but she's also so, so like kind of just so able to tell us where we are headed in a way that I think people really need to hear or even just consider, even if they disagree, to just hear her out. Um, so I'm really excited about that. I'm really, really, really excited. I'm like uh, about The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. Um, who wrote The Mothers. Um, she has one coming out and I'd like a, like, I'm fascinated by passing narratives. Um, when people are passing for when black folks are passing for white, um, it's about which I think is one of whom is one of whom passes for white and the other. Yes, exactly. So I'm really excited to read that. I thought the mothers was extraordinary. And so that's a really fun one. I'm excited to read Rodham, which is just out, um, which I feel like feels kind of just, I think the political is really speaking to me right now. Um, Natalie Diaz, poetry. I've been really excited about poems. So Post-colonial love poem I'm super excited about. I never managed to read, um, this is not just coming out, so forgive me, but um, Homie, Danette Smith's book. 
um, which I've been reading like a poem a day from for the past couple of days and it's just been killing me and I'm gonna just read that through the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, I'm looking through, there's a, you know, um, the Black Cabinet, the Jill Watts book, which is about uh, African-Americans in politics during the age of Roosevelt, which is like something that I plan to dig into the summer. I've been watching Ken Burns's The Roosevelt's. Um, I've been watching a lot of PBS docs. Um, so it's just, you know, Percival Everett, Telephone, he's my favorite. That just came out and I'm obsessed, obsessed with him. So there's yeah. a lot, it's a good summer. I mean, and then the number one, and I'll shut up, showstopper of the summer for me, the thing that I cannot wait for, I literally, like called the publisher and was like, is there a way for you to get this to a post office for me is Isabel Wilkerson's cast. Mm -hmm. She is the author of The Warmth of Other Suns, which was a comprehensive, stunning, extraordinary uh, story of the great migration. And this is about class. And she's looking at sort of caste systems all around the world and thinking about where we, how we ended up here today. And that is the thing that I truly cannot wait for. Yeah, that, that one's been highly anticipated ever since the warmth of other suns came out really <laughs> um mm -hmm. there's such serious work that it takes a while but now it's, yeah now, it's yeah. here and i can't when i saw it i was like oh! <laughs> it's finally here um Carl, are you doing any other, I mean, you mentioned criticism as sort of a go-to yeah. for those little drafts of inspiration or it, it does feel like a good time for bite-sized pieces of things. I don't, I've tried a couple of, to pick up a couple of, you know, much more ambitious sprawling things. And I do find myself going through shorter books very quickly as opposed mm -hmm. to that. Um, is there anything else you're reading for, let's call it comfort or distraction? Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, I think I'm reading some with your daughter. Am I reading some with her? Yeah, she's, she's a, uh very tyrannical in what she wants to read. So we're reading sort of obsessively frozen again and again, but we're also reading Alice in Wonderland, which has been fantastic in this moment um, to think about. Talk a little bit about that, because it was a part of that. Uh, oh yeah, because I, I think I did talk about Alice. And, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's a book, I, I don't even know how many times I'd read it or even read it to her. And I only realized last week why she follows the white rabbit. It's not that he's dressed, it's not that he's speaking, it's that he pulls out this little watch and she sort of gets on his time. And she's in Wonderland, which is sort of, its own eerie laws and physics. And um, yeah, it reminded me a little bit about how we're living now and sort of experiencing this, you know, loss of, of our routines, but at the same time living obsessed with time. When is the vaccine coming? How long has this been disinfected? How long can I go on? When is summer camp coming? You know, when will I see my parents? All of these things that are sort of um, simmering with these questions. But I mean, another thing that I, I do, uh, I have been reading. I, I didn't think I would miss um, uh, going out as much as I do, going to plays, going to sort of live things. As, as somebody who's so monkish and so lazy and <laughs> lives in New York and never does anything. But suddenly now that I can't do it, I long for it, all of this. Um, and I've been reading plays. I've been reading um, like lots of Ibsen plays. I've been reading some old Tennessee Williams. Just like that feeling of, I think, missing performance, missing um, that spectacle, you know. I'm missing doing it with other people, but even you alone, ever, sort of, it's sort of. Enlist your husband and daughter to play other roles and do that. It's your... Why are you suggesting these things? They will absolutely pick really you up on this. I don't want to see this. I don't want to see my daughter in streetcar. She would love it though. She she would emote. <laughs> she would do a beautiful job. Reading plays is actually amazing. It's yeah. like I've been. Yeah. I was reading a bunch before um, the pandemic set in, and it was like so exciting to just like you know I read Slave Play, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which I'd seen, but it was mm -hmm. just interesting to read it. And then I'd been reading. Um, uh, Brandon Jacob Jenkins, um, and just a few other, Octoroon, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, and it's just been, it's so fast and it's like a snack, but also yeah. so deep and it reminds you of the theater and it reminds you, you know, going out and still reading. And it's domestic. And I think in this moment, it's a very inward moment and we're suddenly with our families or in our homes and looking at the familiar in this way that feels very intense and novelistic to me almost. And when you read these plays or you read these novels that are about the situation, they really do feel like they're speaking to us or we're maybe mm -hmm. on their frequency in a way that we haven't been because we are so here. We're so in a Eugene O'Neill endless family drama. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Aren't we're we? Stuck. We really we're, are. We're in act two forever right now. So I feel like there's something, um, that really does, there's a quality of good black humor that is happening. Did, did either or both of you have trouble at all when this all first started of getting into your reading habit? I, I found that it, it didn't take too, too long, but there was yeah. probably a week, week and a half where it didn't feel possible to really um, get distracted. Can I ask you a question? Did you have a book that brought you back to reading? 
Uh, I, I don't think it was, I think it was a coincidence. I think I was just sort of ready for a book, but I did read a, um, a great novel that I talked about on the podcast called The Jest of God by a Canadian writer named Margaret Lawrence. And um, she's sort of my discovery this year. So I'm actually, now that was a couple of months ago and now I'm reading her, another one called The Stone Angel, which I think is um, even better known and is also fantastic. She's, um, Canadians made fun of me on Twitter. Literary Canada came after me because when I said A Jest of God was so good, they said, oh, it takes a pandemic for an American to, I mean, <laughs> like Hemingway up there, like you study her in school and she's, you know, a yeah. national icon. Um, but she's fantastic. And actually I would strongly recommend her as pandemic reading because the books are very, very wise. They just like, they're not timely, but they just have this sort of human um, wisdom. They remind me of William Maxwell and Marilyn Robinson. And there's sort of very broad questions of faith and meaning that, um, that get worked into these stories. And, uh, and I find them, they're not cheery, but they're sort of, they're comforting in a way, just because you feel so immersed in like humanity, which is what we're all missing these days, I think, whether it's at the yeah. theater or a concert or, um, or running into Lisa on the street in Brooklyn, which I haven't done in at least 72 days. That but. one hurt, John, that hurt. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, are there any plans of coming back, Lisa? When are we getting you back? And what are the plans for the National Book Awards? That, that's yeah, so I have no announcements about the National Book Awards. I mean, I, but to answer your earlier question, it's been really hard for me to read. Like as a person who sort of, and it's like, I feel like it's important to admit that because I think there's a lot of people that are working in books, people who have constantly, you know, looked to books for comfort. I think supporting books, knowing what's coming out, having a stack around me has been as comforting as it ever has. I don't know that my ability to sit down and really dive through an enormous amount of material over a short period of time has been intact. And I don't know that it is yet. I think I just found out actually this morning that Memorial Day was this weekend. I did not know. Um, and I think like I look at the stack and I say, okay, now I'm ready. Now I'm ready to really read all these books. And it's been difficult. I think you're also running a nonprofit, right? So you know, it's a very different, I mean, running anything at this time is hard, but you're, you're scrambling trying to get PPP loans and you're scrambling trying to figure out if you'll survive this. You know, we just closed submissions for the National Book Awards yesterday. Um, shouts to the team that got that done, Anna Dobbin again and uh, Meredith Andrews, but like, you know, 1700 submissions roughly, um, all digital. PDFs going out to 25 different judges around the country that did not know they were going to need to read PDFs. You know, I mean, it's been really consuming. You're also thinking about how you can help communities. We're thinking about how to, you know, widen the impact of our, you know, work with HUD and making sure that young people for the summer get books, you know, and then figuring out, of course, the question that I'm sure everybody would like the answer to, what will the National Book Awards look like, which I have no answer for you right now. Well, um, I, look, I look forward to the eventual essay that comes out of the 25 judges all reading PDFs and the process. And and I thank you on behalf of everybody for the work you guys do and continue to do during this thanks. time. Thanks. We're excited. We're going to keep on. The show's going to go. Lisa, I have no doubt you keep on, and that is a, that is a truth of life. Um, and <laughs> Carl, thank you for being here too. Thanks, um, we have to wrap up. Unfortunately, I wish I could invite you both over to my sunny stoop to talk about books more. This is making yeah. me very wistful. Soon, soon, each um, other. I'll so, be home soon. And thank and thank you all for joining us today. My thanks to Carl and Lisa, and to Pamela. Paul and Ann Patchett as well, of course, for their earlier panel um, discussion. This event is part of a slate of virtual events that the Times is hosting. And to see more about upcoming events, please visit timesevents.nytimes.com. And thank you to our Times subscribers. You make our work possible, especially at this difficult time. And we look forward to speaking with you all again soon. Take care and stay thank well. Thank you everybody. so much. Thanks. Stay well.